Welcome back to Lunchtime Agenda. Joining me now is Parliamentary Secretary to the PM, Alan Touch. Thanks for joining us. Hello, also Shadow Minister for Indigenous Affairs, Shane Newman. Laura. Now, it is a week on since the Prime Minister went to Arnhem Land, as promised at the election. Do you think, Alan Touch, there were, were problems that the Prime Minister recognised in trying to keep that promise every year and running the country from Arnhem Land? Do you think he'll be able to do it in the future? I think he will, and that's his, certainly his commitment. It worked pretty well up there, where, we'll be at, where we were able to do the, the deep engagement with the local people on the ground, but from time to time the Prime Minister did have to duck out and we had full um, secure communications, and so he was able to operate um, from up there as well. What was so productive about the visit? What did the Prime Minister actually get out of it? I think it was really about engagement and we had a deep engagement, not just the Prime Minister, but eight ministers who were up there, along with their secretaries of the department, for several days. And we saw the good and the bad, as you so often see in remote communities. There's there's the great stuff about the depth of the culture which still exists up there, the, the productive businesses which they're trying to get going with their royalties money. But at the same time, we saw the depth of the school attendance problems, the employment problems, the alcohol and drug problems, despite it being a dry area. Now, one of the areas is, of course, the biggest area is Indigenous recognition in the Constitution. Shane Newman, of course, there needs to be a timeline. The public needs to be with, with this uh, for any change to be complete. Is the goal at the moment bipartisan, do you think, or is that specific questions still to be worked out? Well, it must be bipartisan to get it through. Uh, 1967 saw more than 90% of Australians vote for uh, giving the Commonwealth power to deal with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and their laws. But it's crucial that we uh, have a bipartisan approach. Uh, Labor's position is that it mustn't be just symbolic, it has to be substantive as well. Mm. I think that's the hopes and dreams and aspirations of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. They've had dislocation, dispossession and discrimination for more than two centuries. They really want that protection in the Constitution. They want there to be a recognition of their prior occupation of this continent. Just on that question, Alan Tudge, then, where does this where do we start when trying to formulate this question? Labor's saying they don't want this to just be as symbolic, but then are there inherent problems in going that step further? And, you know, is there, is there a tipping point where you think, you know, the public might be lost? Where's, where's the government's starting point? Well, we have to work through this, Laura, but our starting point is we've got a joint select committee headed up by um, Ken White and Nova Paris, and they've been consulting broadly, providing some advice. We've had a separate committee which is headed up by John Anderson, who's just tabled his report, to give us a flavour for where the Australian people are at right now. And we need to work through with Aboriginal people, with the opposition, to try to come up with a form of words which we can all agree on. And Shane's absolutely right. Unless we have not just bipartisan support, but a unanimous consensus across the community, then this referendum question won't get up. And I think that would be a disaster for Australia. We want this to be a, a unifying moment in our history, not um, potentially putting up a question which could go down. Discriminate according to race. Where does the government sit with Listen, that word? I, I don't think that we will support that, and there's many people who wouldn't support that. Mm -hmm. And should we put that question up? Frankly, I think that would be the end of the referendum. Because what such a question would do, A, it goes beyond the, re the recognition question, and B, I think that there's a lot of constitutional conservatives who, are, who would be concerned that it would put power in the hands of the courts and away from the parliament by putting such a provision okay. in the constitution. Well, well, Newman, we, what's your response to that? Well, we had the expert panel recommend a uh, new section 116A, there are a number of ways you can do this. Um, you can have an, a, a new section 51A that has a provision in there that talks about that uh, the Commonwealth has got power to pass laws but not so as to adversely discriminate against Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Mm. The problem at the moment with section 5126 is there is some High Court comment in relation to the Hindmarsh Island decision that the federal government can pass laws that discriminate adversely against Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Mm. So there is a problem there. We also have a provision in the Constitution, Section 25, that gives tacit endorsements to the states to exclude people from voting. Most Australians would be horrified about that provision remaining in the 21st century in our Constitution. We've got to find what John Anderson and Tanya Hosh in their report that Alan was referring to described as the sweet spot. The sweet spot that gets a lot of people, constitutional progressives as well as conservatives across the line. But really there needs to be some form of 
of substantive change. It can't be just symbolic. Otherwise, Australians will not want to spend $100 million mm. on this process. It needs to be real and substantive change. Are there failures of the past here by both sides of government that haven't really got the Australian public to where we need to be in this debate? I mean, hindsight's a beautiful thing, of course, Alan Tudge, but what went wrong in the last couple of years? We have had some significant steps. The apology to the stolen generation being one of those significant steps, but we haven't there's not enough uh, recognition, there's not enough, enough public consensus or even acknowledgement that this needs to be happen, happen. So is it going to take two years? Is it going to take three years or can it be done sooner? Well, we haven't set on a date yet, but the Prime Minister will be announcing shortly a timetable that we'll be sticking to. But the key thing is we want to put a referendum question up which will succeed mm -hmm. and that will govern our timetable. Now, the Anderson report, which just came down, showed that only about 60% of the Australian public were even aware of the fact that we were discussing um, constitutional That's recognition. Right. And of that, only about 16% of all Australians have a deep understanding of the issues at stake. So there's still a long way to go in terms of bringing the Australian people um, along in terms of understanding what the Constitution is presently and what such a change might entail. Shane Newman? Well, I think that Australians will focus on this issue once a question is devised. And it needs to be devised between Labor in opposition and the government as well as bringing in other parties. Now, I think it, once we get that question, I think Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and the public will focus on it. I agree with Alan, we can't have it fail. 67 was a defining moment. We've had a number of moments in the history of the Commonwealth of Australia. 67 referendum, uh, Mabo, the native title, the Redfern speech by, by Prime Minister uh, Keating. And we've seen the, the apology to the stolen generation. This could build on that. That's an historic opportunity. I think there is a window of opportunity. There's only been eight out of 44 succeed. And if Labor and Liberal get together and the other parties, we can achieve this. But it needs to be bipartisan. It needs to be, uh, the public needs to be aware of it. And recognised needs to be supported. And that's what John Anderson and Tanya Hosh said. Their campaign needs to continue and be properly funded. All right, let's look at some uh, more recent success. Attendance, mm -hmm. school attendance in Indigenous communities. Well, there is some success in this. I think there was some anecdotal evidence a couple of weeks ago that, yeah, there had been an influx of children attending school. There was, uh, I guess... It was a victim of its own success, this program, in many mm, ways. Mm. Uh, and the Prime Minister, Alan Tudge, did last week hint that, yes, if it's necessary and if there's more children going to school, there will be more funding. When will that happen? And what benchmarks, I guess, do you use to actually gauge success across the board, not in just some areas? Yes, sure, Laura. Um, this is our number one priority in Indigenous affairs because if kids aren't at school, they're not going to learn and they'll end up on the welfare queue. Now, at the moment, in a place like the Northern Territory, fewer than one in four kids are attending sufficiently enough to learn properly. You know, that is a catastrophe. Now, what we've done already is put in place or funded local attendance offices. And what this means is literally local people who will go around in the morning, knock on the doors and drag the kids to school and get them there. Um, we've had some successes from that already. About 17% more children in the Northern Territory are attending school this year compared to the same time last year. So that's a great result. But as we discovered even last week in North East Arnhem Land, when we visited uh, Yakala Primary School, despite having the school attendance offices in place, the school attendance rate's still only 55%, mm. which is just not good enough. And so we're looking at other measures that we can put in place as well. And we're asking for um, community groups, for Indigenous leaders to come forward with proposals themselves, and we've got a funding program to support them, to boost that school attendance rate up. Mm, so a good practical solution, would you agree? Well, I, I've got a proposal they should do if they're looking for other measures. Fund the 38 children and family centres to get kids ready for school, which they didn't proceed with. We had a national partnership arrangement with the states and territories to fund these kids and these centres to get them ready for school. And it was important, not just in terms of, of school, but sexual health and, and, and childcare and other types of activities. But this was getting it ready. Has they shown didn't the fund results, it. Though, no, it's it? patchy. It's patchy and erratic. That's what Senate estimates show. There are some areas of success, but the areas of, that haven't been successful. And they've taken away $46.5 million in remote jobs funding to achieve what they've done. That's a, really a sad, sorry situation. And they think they can cut their way to closing the gap. You can't cut over $500 million from Indigenous program funding and think you can close the gap. And you can't do that by, 
by achieving uh, what they want to achieve in terms of school attendance. Your response, just quickly. Oh, listen, if money was the answer, we would have closed the gap years ago. We've had an 80% real increase in funding over the last 10 years. The average expenditure per Indigenous person in the country today is $44,000. It's probably double that in the remote areas. What we need to do is focus on the basics, getting kids to school, getting adults into work and getting communities safe. Because when, when those three things happen, when those three things happen, other things tend to take care of themselves. Well, that's not happening in the funding cuts. They've cut the legal aid, they've cut Indigenous health, they've cut a whole range of areas. Just finally, I want to move on to the Forest Review. Uh, there's things raised in that review by Andrew Forrest, like the welfare card, um, a different tax rate for Indigenous business. Is the government going to accept most of these recommendations and when can we see an uh, ironclad answer? Yeah, thanks, Laura. We've just had a, we've just finished a consultation process which came to a close over the weekend. Um, in that consultation process, so I think that everybody was aware of the depth of the problems and appreciated such a, uh, a broad scope in the report from, from early childhood through to training and work. We're now digesting the feedback that we've got. We're working through that and we'll be able to make some announcements sooner rather than later. By but, the end of the year? Or but but bear in mind, just sooner rather than later, but bear in mind that this is not a, a, a two-week program. This is a generational program, if you like, and some measures will take years to implement fully while others are easier to implement in the short term. And Shane Newman, just quickly, Labor's response to this, largely supportive of the forest reviews? Well, we've had some discussions with Andrew Forrest and I'll continue to do that along with our spokesperson Brendan O'Connor. There's some interesting ideas in there. Some of the ideas I think are worth merit. Some of them I'm sure the government won't proceed with and the opposition wouldn't agree as well. But I like the idea, the emphasis on early childhood education. I like the emphasis on transparency and accountability. The website's an interesting concept as well. So we'll have further discussions. We'll see what the government comes up with. That's a low-hanging fruit if I might say but there's other things like the welfare card a different tax bracket. Is Labor uh, well, can, I, can I just say there's some quiet indignity in giving people cash to spend on their own needs, goods and services, rather than the idea Sorry, of... Sorry, Shane Newman, I will have to interrupt. We are going to take you now to the floor of the House of Representatives where the Prime Minister is on his feet, updating the Parliament on national security.